This is Mike McGowan, a retired FBI special agent who spent most of his 31-year career undercover. I worked undercover against some of the more sophisticated, complex criminal organizations, such as La Cosa Nostra, which is the mob, Russian organized crime, and also the Sinaloa cartel led by Chapo Guzman. Mike is going to tell us what movies have gotten right and wrong about organized crime and FBI procedures. be clear that I will not discuss nor disclose any undercover tradecraft or techniques that I believe will aid the criminal element nor jeopardize the safety of current law enforcement undercover personnel. First up, reservoir dogs. Seen, man, memorize it. What? Look, man, undercover cops got to be Marlon Brando, right? To do this job, you got to be a great actor. You got to be naturalistic. You got to be naturalistic as hell. In undercover work, there's a five-step training process. It's preparation, 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 and go do it. As part of our undercover training, when I train young undercovers, I will send them into an actual bar. I will point out an individual and tell him or her that they need to contact that individual and come back with that person's mother's maiden name. You can't text them, you can't email them, you gotta sit down, look them in the eye and convince them that they want to do a deal with you. It's the details to sell your story. And this particular story takes place in a men's room. So you got to know all the details about the men's room. You got to know if they got paper towels or a blower to dry your hands. Those details are critically important. Those are things that if someone has been there and you have not, and you don't describe it accurately, you've already screwed up the investigation. I had a connection with this hippie chick up in Santa Cruz and all my friends knew it. They give me a call and they say, Hey, Freddie. So what happens in real life is we have what's called a legend. A legend is who you are as an undercover. Your identity, your story, your history, etc. And you have to create that yourself. You can get help from senior agents or more experienced people, but the story has to be realistic and things that you know, so you have to develop your own legend. So at the height of my undercover activity, I had approximately six different identifications. And people think, how could you remember six different identifications? But of all six, the core elements, the things that you understand all were the same. I love golden retrievers. You don't lie until you have to lie to gather evidence. So I had six identities and uh, probably 80% of it was all the same. So I walk in the men's room, and who's standing there? Four Los Angeles County Sheriffs and a German Shepherd. That's hard, man. That's a f***ing hard situation. <laughs> you need to get the bad guys to like you before you can make a deal with them. So when you tell a story like this young officer did, He's building rapport, he's building trust, he's acting natural. He's just talking to a bunch of guys in a bar. Uh, you can't be stiff, you can't be rigid, you gotta tell some jokes, tell a funny story, and that's what he did. He's barking at me. I mean, it's obvious he's barking at me. The only guarantee is nothing will go as planned. One time that I was dealing with the mob and I had on a very expensive suit, probably $1,500 suit, and I also had on a pair of JCPenney socks, which cost about eight bucks, and the informant, the person I was working with to introduce me in this group, pointed out that they would recognize I was wearing a cheap pair of socks with a very expensive suit, and they notice everything. To do this job, you gotta be a great actor. So the only thing that I really didn't like in this scene is when the older cop tells him that he's acting. You're not acting because you don't get take two. If you make a mistake, it literally can be fatal. You could be killed or at a minimum, you screw up the investigation. Next up, The Departed. In this scene, Jack Nicholson plays a mob boss selling microprocessors to the Chinese while Leonardo DiCaprio serves as a young undercover police officer while the transaction is being monitored back at police headquarters. We have a blind spot. Why do we have a blind spot? We had two hours notice. Two hours. You think this is NASA? It never crossed my mind. Have you got a camera in the back? What back? What they got right, for the most part, was the interaction within the command center or the monitoring room. It's chaos, the technical equipment doesn't function properly. Those are very common occurrences. That, unfortunately, is pretty much the main realistic part. I want to tell you, these two of these gents have machine guns. 
two dozen people show up for a major meeting, that just doesn't happen. Every person in that room is a potential informant down the road. If they're going to hear and see everything you've done, you have to be prepared that they're going to compromise you. In this case here, you had the mob boss and underlings. Well, only he and the main negotiator for the Chinese should have been there. You always see these meetings taking place in desolate warehouses or garages. That's not very accurate. If I have an important meeting, I'll have it in the lobby of the Park Plaza Hotel. You hide in plain sight. Did you put a camera in the back? Can I talk to you for a second, please? You stupid I've never seen a fight in a room, but I've seen it get pretty close, so I don't know if we want to go there, but the frustration level is very accurate. Next up, Donnie Brasco. You're down the jewel. In this next clip, you have Donnie Brasco posing as a jewel thief undercover in order to attend his first meeting with Lefty Ruggiero, played by Al Pacino. This is the first time Brasco's meeting Ruggiero, but what's done earlier as part of his legend building and his backstopping, he spent time in this bar room and became friends with the bartender who led him to the mob guys. He didn't go directly to the mob guys. He let it be known that he was a jewel thief. The mob ended up finding him. When you have the legend, the legend is who you are, where you're from, what you do, etc. Backstopping is the filling of that. It's filling in your story to appear real. When Ruggiero first comes in and tries to talk to him, Brasco looks at the bartender to get confirmation he's a real mobster. So that was very effective in that part of the preparation process I've discussed. Yeah. There's some beautiful thing. Why don't you give it to your wife? My wife? How am I going to give it to my wife? I ain't married. You got a girlfriend? Yeah, I got a girlfriend, yeah. So marry her. Right, because that's a fugazi. All right? That's a fugazi? How do you know it's a fugazi? You looked at it for two seconds. Rather than telling Ruggiero what he wants to hear, he tells him it's no good, it's not worth anything to give it to his girlfriend. Yes, if you're gonna say you're a jewel thief, you better know jewelry. And in this case, Brasco actually attended jewelry school. He went out on his own and went to school to do that. And I had one investigation where I was undercover as a, a state inspector, and I had to go to dirt school to learn about dirt. And believe me, there's a lot to learn about dirt that I didn't know until I went to dirt school, but once I went, and it, it was also an organized crime case, I was able to talk dirt to the bad guys and pass off as I was a state official in which they later bribed me for a state contract. Boardwalk Empire. 30. In the following scene, a Prohibition undercover agent is intensely questioned by Al Capone for fears that he's a rat. When you move to Cicero, 1922. From where? Minnesota, Ortonville. We owned a wheat farm. It went belly up. How do you f up a wheat farm? <laughs> Brown rust. It rots the leaf. In this scene, I thought the undercover agent did a phenomenal job of talking his way out of trouble. If you're an undercover, eventually you're going to be challenged. It's inevitable, so why not? prepare and he obviously had prepared his legend in advance. He was able to cite specific history with the bad guys, so he did a excellent job under extreme pressure. Start. I worked for you for seven six, years. Seven. I broke heads in eight, Cicero. I nine, set up Dino Bannon. I make my number 11, every week. Wow. There's a myth out there that if someone asks you if you're law enforcement while you're undercover, you have to answer in the affirmative. That's not True, I've been challenged multiple times. The first time I was challenged, when somebody said, you're an FBI agent, I said, yeah, I'm J. Edgar Hoover. And he immediately started laughing and we went off and finished what we were doing because I just disarmed him with the, the humor. Maybe I'm a federal agent, maybe I'm a bigamist, maybe I'm a murderer on the run. Believe what you want, there's no way I can stop you. But that's not what matters now. It's not. When you're faced with a life or death situation, you probably want the bad guys to know that you are, in fact, law enforcement as opposed to a cooperator. That's a very effective technique because the bad guys, most criminals, at least sane criminals, don't want to kill law enforcement because if you kill a federal agent, the government's going to get you. Like he didn't say, don't kill me, I'm a federal agent, which is sometimes what the recommendation is. 
okay? But he, he at least leaves them with that hint that they don't need that trouble. Probably the most realistic part of that exchange is when he asks to use the bathroom at the end because that's what you feel like after walking out of one of those places. What did I say? You don't remember? I need a men's room. You me sick? I may have soiled myself. The Sopranos. The following clip shows the day-to-day -day mob life of Tony Soprano and his crew. Mm. Let me just throw it. I didn't even see it. Oh, a long-lost leader. It's pretty much accurate about the day-to-day -day doings of a mob crew and uh, family. They spend a lot of time smoking, playing cards, talking about nonsense. They just spend a lot of time together. If you're working undercover against the mob, you have to know that you're going to be tied up for hours and hours and hours talking about basically nonsense and maybe five or 10 minutes of criminal conversation. I worked three different crime, uh, LCN families for about 10 years, and I enjoyed my time with them as far as talking to them about different things. They're, they're pretty funny. They have good senses of humor. They have interesting stories, and not everything is criminally related. Tony. Oh, Agent Harry. How you doing? How are you? Good, good to see you. FBI agents assigned to the organized crime squad. It's a little bit of a cat and mouse game that we play. We, you know, you'll you'll make sure they know you're there and you exchange pleasantries. You never know when one of them may decide to call you and want to jump over the, to the other side. It's a good give and take, and they just make sure that each other knows the other's out there. Next up, Goodfellas. Paulie hated phones. He wouldn't have one in his house. He used to get all his calls secondhand, then you'd have to call the people back from an outside phone. In this scene here, the fear of telephones is very accurate. In the LCN, back in the 70s or 80s, they used to feel free to be on the telephone, but once the federal government, specifically the FBI, started to wiretap their phones, they became extremely cautious on the phone. So. That, in and of itself, in that scene, is very accurate. There were guys that's all they did, all day long, was take care of Paulie's phone calls. What's not accurate in that same scene, though, is they take the message and they run across the street, directly across the street from his house and use a pay phone. So with surveillance, the FBI would recognize that's the phone that they wanted to be listened to next. Everything was one-on-one. -on -one. Paulie hated conferences. He didn't want anybody hearing what he said and he didn't want anybody listening to what he was being told. The use of wiretaps, which is legally known as Title III interceptions, those interceptions were first used heavily during the early 80s. Mafia members still were sloppy or lazy and would use the phones, and many of them were caught because of that, but the disciplined members wouldn't touch the phone. So even if they had to take a plane trip to Las Vegas or Chicago. If it was that important, they just wouldn't talk to anybody until they were face to face in person. Next up, Scarface. I was in that movie, nice. Burn. They're conducting money laundering transaction. And in general, what money laundering means is you're taking dirty money, which is money made from criminal activity, in this case, drug trafficking, and converting it into legitimate income. They have so much drug proceeds, they can't walk into the bank and deposit it so they have to convert it into another financial form. Get him up! Get your hands up! Put your hands against the wall, turn around. We're not kidding. Put him up against the wall. I know this is a famous movie and it's back in the day, but those are antiquated arrest procedures anyway. We did, if that's not the way you arrest people in an undercover operation. There's two on two, you're in one room with one door and you can put 20 agents outside uh, they pull out their weapons, and those weapons can be taken again away from you. So just let them leave and, and let the other guys grab them. Put them up against the wall. You're under arrest for violation of the RICO statute. You have a right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be taken against hey, you. F*** you. How do I know you guys are cops, huh? When the federal agent stood up to arrest him, he claimed he was violating the RICO statute. The RICO statute is what's known as the Racketeer and Influence Corruption Organization. RICO is a very powerful federal tool that we use, which basically you're allowed to attack the enterprise as opposed to the individual. So back in the day in the mafia, when a, when a mob boss ordered a murder, he 
didn't commit the murder, but he could be held responsible as part of the enterprise. Also, this idea that undercover agents make the arrest, incite the legal citations, etc. That's, in my opinion, that's not accurate. I don't remember ever arresting anybody I worked undercover against. I would always leave or let somebody else arrest them. You've done your job. Next up, The Irishman. Can I get some more for next Tuesday? In the following clip, Frank, played by Robert De Niro, sells meat off of a truck to the mob. The part that was most realistic to me was the common street hustle that Frank engages in. He's employed with a meat company, obviously, but he's making a side business selling some of it off the back of his truck. And as you noticed in the clip, he makes sure to take care of the people that he needs to take care of in order for the scam to work. This is very common in urban areas at this time area. If you look historically at the Fulton Fish Market in their connection to the LCN in New York, the LCN basically ran that place for years and it wasn't until the mid 80s, late 80s that that relationship became known and prosecuted in federal court. It's a case study that's often um, shown about the relationship between the mob and uh, legitimate business. Can I get some more for next Tuesday? How many you want? At least five. <laughs> he slid a couple of sides of beef off and then the next thing is him sitting at the table having dinner with the mob and talking about getting more steak, etc. cetera. Uh, that's not a very savvy mobster as far as I'm concerned. Just because somebody gave you a steak dinner, they don't get a seat at the table. The mob will take you in if you're making them money, but you gotta make them real money. They're called earners. He's, that's what an earner is described for, somebody who can make money for the mob. And they'll tolerate him or give him some acceptance but he's not sitting around hearing all the secrets at the table, that's for sure. Next, the cement shoes in Billy Bathgate. You got him? Hold on to him. I can tell you that I've never known, heard, or seen anyone put in cement shoes. It's not a technique that I'm familiar with. It doesn't make any sense to me because who's going to allow themselves to let Somebody put their feet in cement without resisting. I'm not sure why Bruce Willis would allow himself to be put in that position unless he was unconscious or not able to defend himself. True detective. In this following clip, the undercover officer participates in an armed robbery in order to get information on a current investigation. And it goes horribly wrong. What's wrong is that the undercover officer initiates and encourages violence. That can't happen. That's not realistic. Law enforcement personnel can only react to violence in self-defense. We cannot initiate or encourage violence. If you're in an undercover capacity and you're asked to commit an act of violence by the people you're with, the bottom line is you have to get away or, or not do it. When you're actually in real undercover work as law enforcement, you have to set yourself up in a position that you're not considered just another neighborhood thug. You want to be a money guy, you want to be a, a driver, somebody who just doesn't grab a baseball bat and hit somebody across the back of the head. Next up, Narcos. In this clip, Pablo Escobar meets with Carlos, who will be flying his cocaine into the United States. The real game changer was filling later's planes with coke instead of weed. What I think they got right was the manner in which cocaine was transported from Colombia to the United States in the late 70s, early 80s. This was before there was a interdiction effort on the part of the U.S. government, so planes were allowed to enter the United States with very little uh, notice, and that's originally how trafficking started between Colombia and the United States. ¿Qué pasa si sacamos los asientos, los tapetes, los extintores y todo eso que no sirve, dejamos solamente espacio para el piloto? ¿Cabe más? Menos el motor. 
Serán 300 más. So they wanted to take out the interior of the plane to maximize the loads, which was a common occurrence in those days. Those were basically drug planes and used for nothing else. So by removing some of the interior items, they were able to put more cocaine, which is less of a risk. <clears throat> If you can get more in in one shot, then you're taking less risk that it will be seized. Listo, pues, señor Carlos. Cuadremos esta vuelta. I wouldn't suspect that Pablo Escobar would make himself available to somebody that he doesn't know and somebody who's been in prison who very well could have been an informant. I think there would have been more of a delay between introducing the pilot to Escobar as the top dog. If I was Pablo Escobar, I never would have been around the airport that day. You've now seen that Hollywood gets some things right and some things wrong. The bottom line is after watching all these clips, my advice to you would be the risk is not worth the reward and crime does not pay.